Basil of Caesarea, also called Saint Basil the Great, was the Greek bishop of Caesarea Misaka in Cappadocia, Asia Minor. He was an influential theologian who supported the Nicene Creed and opposed the heresies of the early Christian Church. Fighting against both Arianism and the followers of Apollinaris of Laodicea, his ability to balance his theological convictions with his political connections made Basil a powerful advocate for the Nicene position. In addition to his work as a theologian, Basil was known for his care of the poor and underprivileged. Basil established guidelines for monastic life which focus on community life, liturgical prayer, and manual labor. Together with Pachomius, he is remembered as a father of communal monasticism in Eastern Christianity. He is considered a saint by the traditions of both Eastern and Western Christianity. Basil, Gregory of Nazianzus, and Gregory of Nyssa are collectively referred to as the Cappadocian Fathers. The Eastern Orthodox Church and Eastern Catholic Churches have given him, together with Gregory of Nazianzus and John Chrysostom, the title of Great Hierarch. He is recognized as a doctor of the Church in both Eastern Orthodoxy and in the Roman Catholic Church. He is sometimes referred to by the epithet Omicron Epsilon Rho Alpha Nu Omicron Phi Alpha Nu Tau Omega Rho, Revealer of Heavenly Mysteries, Life. Early life and education Basil was born into the wealthy family of Basil the Elder, a famous rhetor, and Emelia of Caesarea, in Pontus, around 330. His parents were renowned for their piety. His maternal grandfather was a Christian martyr, executed in the years prior to Constantine I's conversion. His pious widow, Macrina, herself a follower of Gregory Thaumaturgus, raised Basil and his four siblings. Macrina, the younger, Norcratius, Peter of Sebasta and Gregory of Nyssa. Basil received more formal education in Caesarea Misaka in Cappadocia around 350-51. There he met Gregory of Nazianzus, who would become a lifetime friend. Together, Basil and Gregory went to Constantinople for further studies, including the lectures of Libanius. The two also spent almost six years in Athens starting around 349, where they met a fellow student who would become the Emperor Julian the Apostate. Basil left Athens in 356, and after travels in Egypt and Syria, he returned to Caesarea, where for around a year he practiced law and taught rhetoric. Basil's life changed radically after he encountered Eustathius of Sebasta, a charismatic bishop and ascetic. Abandoning his legal and teaching career, Basil devoted his life to God. A letter described his spiritual awakening. Uneasy after his baptism, Basil traveled in 357 to Palestine, Egypt, Syria and Mesopotamia to study ascetics and monasticism. He distributed his fortunes among the poor, then went briefly into solitude near Neo Caesarea of Pontus on the Iris. Basil eventually realized that while he respected the ascetic's piety and prayerfulness, the solitary life did not call him. Eustathius of Sebasta, a prominent anchorite near Pontus, had mentored Basil. However, they also eventually differed over dogma. Basil instead felt drawn toward communal religious life, and by 358 he was gathering around him a group of like-minded disciples including his brother Peter. Together they founded a monastic settlement on his family's estate near Anisi. His widowed mother Emelia, sister Macrina and several other women, joined Basil and devoted themselves to pious lives of prayer and charitable works. Here Basil wrote about monastic communal life. His writings became pivotal in developing monastic traditions of the Eastern Church. In 358, Basil invited his friend Gregory of Nazianzus to join him in Anisi. When Gregory eventually arrived, they collaborated on Origins Philokalia, a collection of Origins works. Gregory then decided to return to his family in Nazianzus. Basil attended the Council of Constantinople in 360. 
He at first sided with Eustathius and the Homoousians, a semi-Ariam faction who taught that the son was of like substance with the father, neither the same nor different from him. The Homoousians opposed the Arianism of Eunomius but refused to join with the supporters of the Nicene Creed, who professed that the members of the Trinity were of one substance. However, Basil's bishop, Dianius of Caesarea, had subscribed only to the earlier Nicene form of agreement. Basil eventually abandoned the Homoousians, and emerged instead as a strong supporter of the Nicene Creed. Caesarea in 362, Bishop Melitius of Antioch ordained Basil as a deacon. Eusebius then summoned Basil to Caesarea and ordained him as presbyter of the church there in 365. Ecclesiastical entreaties rather than Basil's desires thus altered his career path. Basil and Gregory Nazianzus spent the next few years combating the Arian heresy, which threatened to divide Cappadocia's Christians. In close fraternal cooperation, they agreed to a great rhetorical contest with accomplished Arian theologians and rhetors. In the subsequent public debates, presided over by agents of Valens, Gregory and Basil emerged triumphant. This success confirmed for both Gregory and Basil that their futures lay in administration of the church. Basil next took on functional administration of the city of Caesarea. Eusebius is reported as becoming jealous of the reputation and influence which Basil quickly developed and allowed Basil to return to his earlier solitude. Later, however, Gregory persuaded Basil to return. Basil did so, and became the effective manager of the city for several years, while giving all the credit to Eusebius. In 370, Eusebius died, and Basil was chosen to succeed him, and was consecrated bishop on June 14, 370. His new post as Bishop of Caesarea also gave him the powers of Exarch of Pontus and Metropolitan of five suffragan bishops, many of whom had opposed him in the election for Eusebius' successor. It was then that his great powers were called into action. Hot-blooded and somewhat imperious, Basil was also generous and sympathetic. He personally organized a soup kitchen and distributed food to the poor during a famine following a drought. He gave away his personal family inheritance to benefit the poor of his diocese. His letters show that he actively worked to reform thieves and prostitutes. They also show him encouraging his clergy not to be tempted by wealth or the comparatively easy life of a priest, and that he personally took care in selecting worthy candidates for holy orders. He also had the courage to criticize public officials who failed in their duty of administering justice. At the same time, he preached every morning and evening in his own church to large congregations. In addition to all the above, he built a large complex just outside his area, called the Basiliad, which included a poor house, hospice, and hospital, and was described by Gregory of Nazianzus as one of the wonders of the world. His zeal for orthodoxy did not blind him to what was good in an opponent, and for the sake of peace and charity he was content to waive the use of orthodox terminology when it could be surrendered without a sacrifice of truth. The Emperor Valens, who was an adherent of the Ariam philosophy, sent his prefect Modestus to at least agree to a compromise with the Ariam faction. Basil's adamant negative response prompted Modestus to say that no one had ever spoken to him in that way before. Basil replied, Perhaps you have never yet had to deal with a bishop. Modestus reported back to Valens that he believed nothing short of violence would avail against Basil. Valens was apparently unwilling to engage in violence. He did however issue orders banishing Basil repeatedly, none of which succeeded. Valens came himself to attend when Basil celebrated the Divine Liturgy on the Feast of the Theophany, and at that time was so impressed by Basil that he donated to him some land for the building of the Basiliad. This interaction helped to define the limits of governmental power over the Church. Basil then had to face the growing spread of Arianism. This belief system, which denied that Christ was consubstantial with the Father, was quickly gaining adherence and was seen by many. 
particularly those in Alexandria most familiar with it, as posing a threat to the unity of the Church. The difficulties had been enhanced by bringing in the question as to the essence of the Holy Spirit. Although Basil advocated objectively the consubstantiality of the Holy Spirit with the Father and the Son, he belonged to those who, faithful to Eastern tradition, would not allow the predicate homo ausios to the former. For this he was reproached as early as 371 by the Orthodox zealots among the monks, and Athanasius defended him. He maintained a relationship with Eustathius despite dogmatic differences. Basil corresponded with Pope Damasus in the hope of having the Roman bishop condemn heresy wherever found, both east and west. The Pope's apparent indifference upset Basil's zeal and he turned around in distress and sadness. It is still a point of controversy over how much he believed the Roman see could do for the churches in the east. As many Roman Catholic theologians claim the primacy of the Roman bishopric over the rest of the churches both in doctrine and in authoritative strength, death and legacy. Basil died before the factional disturbances ended. He suffered from liver disease. Excessive ascetic practices also contributed to his early demise. Historians disagree about the exact date Basil died. The Great Institute before the gates of Caesarea, which was used as poorhouse, hospital, and hospice became a lasting monument of Basil's episcopal care for the poor. Writings The principal theological writings of Basil are his on the Holy Spirit, a lucid and edifying appeal to scripture in early Christian tradition, and his refutation of the Apology of the Impious Eunomius, written in 363 or 364, three books against Eunomius of Cyzicus, the chief exponent of Anomalianarianism. The first three books of the Refutation are his work, the fourth and fifth books that are usually included do not belong to Basil, or to Apollinarius of Laodicea. He was a famous preacher, and many of his homilies, including a series of Lenten lectures on the Hexa Ameron, and an exposition of the Psalter, have been preserved, some, like that against usury and that on the famine in 368 are valuable for the history of morals, others illustrate the honor paid to martyrs and relics. The address to young men on the study of classical literature shows that Basil was lastingly influenced by his own education, which taught him to appreciate the propedeutic importance of the classics. In his exegesis Basil was a great admirer of Oregon and the need for the spiritual interpretation of scripture. In his work on the Holy Spirit, he asserts that, to take the literal sense and stop there, is to have the heart covered by the veil of Jewish literalism. Lamps are useless when the sun is shining. He frequently stresses the need for reserve in doctrinal and sacramental matters. At the same time he was against the wild allegories of some contemporaries. Concerning this, he wrote, I know the laws of allegory, though less by myself than from the works of others. There are those, truly, who do not admit the common sense of the scriptures, for whom water is not water, but some other nature, who see in a plant, in a fish, what their fancy wishes, who change the nature of reptiles and of wild beasts to suit their allegories like the interpreters of dreams who explain visions in sleep to make them serve their own end. His ascetic tendencies are exhibited in the Moralia, and Arsketica, ethical manuals for use in the world and the cloister, respectively. There has been a good deal of discussion concerning the authenticity of the two works known as the Greater Arsketican and the Lesser Arsketican. It is in the ethical manuals and moral sermons that the practical aspects of his theoretical theology are illustrated. So, for example, it is in his sermon to the Lazicans that we find Street, Basil explaining how it is our common nature that obliges us to treat our neighbor's natural needs as our own, even though he is a separate individual. Later theologians explicitly explain this as an example of how the saints become an image of the one common nature of the persons of the Trinity. His 300 letters reveal a rich and observant nature, which, despite the troubles of ill health and ecclesiastical unrest, remained optimistic, tender and even playful. 
His principal efforts as a reformer were directed towards the improvement of the liturgy and the reformation of the monastic institutions of the East. Most of his extant works, and a few spuriously attributed to him, are available in the Patrologia Graeca, which includes Latin translations of varying quality. Several of St. Basil's works have appeared in the late 20th century in the Sources Cratian collection. Liturgical Contributions St. Basil of Caesarea holds a very important place in the history of Christian liturgy, coming as he did at the end of the Age of Persecution. Basil's liturgical influence is well attested in early sources, though it is difficult at this time to know exactly which parts of the divine liturgies which bear his name are actually his work. A vast corpus of prayers attributed to him has survived in the various Eastern Christian churches. Tradition also credits Basil with the elevation of the iconostasis to its present height. Most of the liturgies bearing the name of Basil are not entirely his work in their present form, but they nevertheless preserve a recollection of Basil's activity in this field in formularizing liturgical prayers and promoting church song. Patristic scholars conclude that the liturgy of St. Basil bears unmistakably the personal hand, pen, mind and heart of St. Basil the Great. One liturgy that can be attributed to him is the divine liturgy of St. Basil the Great, a liturgy that is somewhat longer than the more commonly used divine liturgy of St. John Chrysostom. The difference between the two is primarily in the silent prayers said by the priest, and in the use of the hymn to the Theotokos, all of creation, instead of the axia nestinen of St. John Chrysostom's liturgy. Chrysostom's liturgy has come to replace St. Basil's on most days in the Eastern Orthodox and Byzantine Catholic liturgical traditions. However, they still use St. Basil's liturgy on certain feast days. The first five Sundays of Great Lent, the Eves of Nativity and Theophany, on Great and Holy Thursday and Holy Saturday and on the Feast of St. Basil, January 1. The Eastern Churches preserve numerous other prayers attributed to St. Basil, including three prayers of exorcism, several morning and evening prayers, the Prayer of the Hours, which is read at each service of the daily office and the kneeling prayers, which are recited by the priest at Vespers on Pentecost in the Byzantine Rite. Influence on Monasticism Through his examples and teachings Basil effected a noteworthy moderation in the austere practices which were previously characteristic of monastic life. He is also credited with coordinating the duties of work and prayer to ensure a proper balance between the two. Basil is remembered as one of the most influential figures in the development of Christian monasticism. Not only is Basil recognized as the father of Eastern monasticism, historians recognize that his legacy extends also to the Western Church, largely due to his influence on St. Benedict. Patristic scholars such as Meredith assert that Benedict himself recognized this when he wrote in the epilogue to his rule that his monks, in addition to the Bible, should read the confessions of the fathers and their institutes and their lives and the rule of our Holy Father, Basil. Basil's teachings on monasticism, as encoded in works such as his small Asketikon, was transmitted to the West via Rufinus during the last 4th century. As a result of his influence, numerous religious orders in Eastern Christianity bear his name. In the Roman Catholic Church, the Basilian Fathers, also known as the Congregation of St. Basil, an international order of priests and students studying for the priesthood, is named after him.